Um, so everyone, my name is Nick Vogelpohl, um, and I'll be your host today, I suppose. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging country. I'm on beautiful Wurundjeri country where summer has finally arrived. Um, and I would like to pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and also to acknowledge all the many Aboriginal lands we're meeting on today. You know, these spaces uh, give us a kind of virtual space that's held, but we're all on, um, on unceded land. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues with us on the call, you're very welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully you're in the right space. This is um, part three of four in our design and evaluation uh, learning sprint from the Australian Evaluation Society. And I'm part of the, um, I suppose, organising group or committee. I don't think we're a committee. We're a group of people who are interested in it. And if you are interested in joining our group of interested people, um, please do reach out. But we've been running these sprints for the last, I think this is like the third year we've done them. And um, and we find that um, bringing in different people who are at that kind of intersection of design and evaluation, whatever that looks like, to, to kind of share some of the things that they're learning about and, uh, um, and the things that are keeping them busy and working on. And we've got um, a really great speaker for you today. Um, I do encourage you to, um, to sign up for tomorrow's session as well. And we've got one more left in the sprint um, with Luke Craven on systems thinking and design. So um, that's there as well. These are all free. We give our time for free. Nico's giving us time for free. So, um, you know, bear with us and, and um, hopefully you have some, some questions and some, um, some engagement in this. The, um, the kind of, uh, I suppose, the program uh, as it stands is that um, I'm going to introduce Nico and then Nico's going to give us a presentation. And we've, I'd love you to gather questions and thoughts as you go through. Please feel free to use the chat um, to, to, to kind of give those questions over or, or wait until the end of the presentation. And, um, and then we'll try and have a bit of a discussion um, towards the end of the session. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce a, a, a different speaker, I think, for the Australian Evaluation Society. This is Nico King um, joining us here. He's um, the co-founder and director of Chaos Theory Games. Uh, hopefully you've read a bit about him anyway um, by signing up to this. But um, Nico does all things on AR, VR, mobile games for different organisations. And I think organisations that many of us have worked with as well, Wood, World Food Programme, uh, DFAT, and, um, and Samsung as well, so kind of from all different sectors. Um, he's going to talk a bit about, oh, I don't know what he's going to talk about, he's going to tell us, but, um, but uh, Nick kind of um, comes in that space between the educational and psychological benefits of games, um, which I think is a really interesting space for us to be talking about um, in evaluation as well. So I'm going to stop there um, and hand over to you, Nico. I think you've got, you should have sharing permissions, so go for it if you've got slides. And anyone, if you've got problems with tech, just reach out to me um, uh, on the chat. Okay. Is that coming through? Awesome. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Nick. And thank you everybody for having me here today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about uh, video games and whether or not they're effective tools. Um, my yeah, my background and experience is in uh, starting a, a game development studio that specializes in uh, creating games that solve real world problems. Um, my um, my experience isn't in evaluation necessarily, um, but what I'm hoping to do today is share with you some information about why games are really powerful tools. Uh, as well as how we might uh, measure specific data within games and how that can be used to, to uh, evaluate the, the efficacy of games themselves um, and show you a few example projects of what we've done in the past. Uh, so starting off, uh, a little bit of background into myself. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of, of Chaos Theory Games. Uh, we specialize in creating games that uh, solve real world problems. And our vision is to improve quality of life and inspire a more sustainable future through the magic of play. Um, as Nick mentioned, we've worked with organizations and, and uh, large companies all across the world. Uh, we've created uh, e-learning experiences, games for health, um, social change projects. Um, so all of them are uh, really focused on some sort of core problem uh, that games can be used to, to help solve. Uh, we also have quite a bit of experience in just the purely entertainment game side of, of game development, uh, where um, uh, the collection of our, our mobile games has been downloaded over 70 million times. Um, and we've found that 
uh, uh, working in that space, uh, just pure entertainment, uh, we've picked up a lot of tools and a lot of experience that we can bring into uh, the sort of transformational games industry, and that can be used to solve real world problems. So there's this really good relationship between those two industries um, where there's a lot of innovation happening in entertainment games, and we can bring that into uh, yeah more, more uh, social good or, or education focused projects. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to be using the term transformational games. Uh, it's the same term as, or the same concept as serious games, which a lot of people would be familiar with, uh, or games for good or impact games. Um, they're, it's, it's all the same focus where you're looking to solve a real world problem using a game. Uh, the primary purpose lies outside of pure entertainment. Uh, we really like the term transformational games as we think it's more descriptive of uh, the sorts of experiences that we create. We're looking to uh, create some sort of transformation within the player or within the broader world. Um, and it's also uh, just a bit more I don't know, inspirational or motivational than serious games. Serious games can sound a little bit boring. Uh, so an introduction into uh, transformational games. I think video games uh, is is so so broad and and so diverse uh, as a field, and it, it's almost an oversimplification for uh, the amazing technology we have at our, at our fingertips. Um, we can create we can have experiences where uh, it's a, a text based narrative adventure where you're exploring the future of, of climate change. Uh, or you've got a, a rocket science simulation where uh, you're looking to learn about rocket science and play around with how to build rockets, uh, or uh, you're creating a, a VR horror experience that's just designed to make uh, people terrified. So what do those look like? Um, up in the top left is the Financial Times uh, climate game, uh, and it's a text-based narrative adventure um, where you uh, see the impact of different decisions now and how they play out in the future. Um, below that is Among Us, which is a social deception game. So you're really just looking to deceive other people and uh, and trick them and lie to them. Um, and it's all about that sort of social interaction uh, between the players. Uh, below that is Kerbal Space Program, uh, which is a rocket science simulation game uh, that was built as an entertainment product, but is also enjoyed by people who work at NASA and has been used in the classroom. So um, it's, yeah, a really fun and interesting uh, game that I, I really enjoy. Um, oh, uh, Candy Crush is up in the, the top left. Uh, that's a mobile game that I'm sure quite a few people would be familiar with, uh, played just for fun. Below that, Monopoly. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that one. Um, uh, interesting story about Monopoly is it was originally designed by a communist uh, who was looking to, to show the negative impacts of capitalism, where one person uh, would just go around the board, uh, get all of the assets, and then have all the money at the end of the game. Everybody else ends up with nothing. Um, and it was originally called Landlord. And considering that it turned out to be the most successful board game of all time and make Hasbro a lot of money, uh, it's a little bit a little bit ironic how that one turned out. Um, and below that is Alien Isolation, which is an absolutely terrifying virtual reality experience that's just built purely for horror. Uh, then there's two, two of our games in the middle. Uh, Kangazoo is a, a game that we developed for, for DFAT. Um, and it's a wildlife uh, uh, simulation game where you go around and explore Australia's national parks uh, and collect and uh, rescue and rehabilitate uh, animals and then release them back into the wild. Uh, below that is uh, Shamila, which is a game that we developed for the United Nations World Food Program uh, on ha uh, and it was designed to help uh, educate and train their staff how to uh, design better policy and make sure that they're, they're helping uh, people. Uh, and so that's a, a sort of safe and simulated training environment uh, where people are free to explore different ideas and, and different um, decisions uh, without the, the sort of um, um, uh, lives of people uh, weigh, weighing on those decisions. Uh, so it really lets them experiment. Uh, so yeah, I think the reason that I wanted to run through all of those is just to show you the, the sort of broad spectrum of what games can be. And whenever I'm talking about games uh, in this presentation, I'm talking about anything from a from a text-based adventure through to a, to a simulation, through to, to a board game or something that's just played for fun. Uh, in terms of uh, the different types of transformational games, uh, I just wanted to go through some broad categories uh, as it might help uh, put into context the sorts of experiences that uh, we would typically develop um, that you might uh, be able to apply to, to a use case. 
Uh, so uh, educational games is a, is a huge one. We do a lot of work for the education industry. Um, that might be for uh, sort of school students, but it can also be uh, education and training for the, for the workplace. Uh, and games can, can be a, a really good use there. Uh, training and simulations. Uh, that's uh, huge in the workplace and lets us practice real world skills in um, a safe uh, simulated environment um, uh, without the, the risk of, of failure, essentially, uh, or without the risk of failure impacting uh, things outside of, of the game environment. Uh, behavior change games is an area where uh, games are particularly well suited for. So uh, whether or not we're building new behaviors or, or changing old behaviors that are, are, are negative or that we want to get rid of, um, games have a lot of tools in order to form new habits. Uh, mobile games in particular are really good at uh, tapping into our, our motivation and, and creating some uh, habitual play of, of you come back to this app at the same time every day. Um, and that can be good for when uh, the behavior change that you're looking for um, uh, takes place over a, a long, longer period of time. Games for health. Um, this could be uh, games for uh, fitness or, or personal health, uh, but also for uh, rehabilitation or in a medical context. Um, uh, games are often used in hospitals uh, to, uh, instead of, of pain treatments or in addition to pain treatments, um, I know that when uh, in, in some hospitals, when kids are getting band-aids changed, uh, they get a game and that's been shown to be a lot more effective at uh, reducing pain and reducing uh, anxiety and stress uh, when compared to, to other options. Uh, empathy games, so uh, games that are looking to uh, help develop em empathy with another person uh, or another group of people. Um, games are particularly well suited for this area because of the active nature of play where when we when we step into a game, we experience it in the first person. We say, oh, I uh, completed the level or I walked down the corridor. Um, you're not observing somebody else uh, go, go through that experience. You're really um, active and you're an active participant in that. So uh, it, it uh, games have the, the capacity to let us walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and that uh, makes them uh, quite well suited for empathy uh, building and empathy development. Uh, citizen science games. Uh, so games can be a really good tool for if you're conducting research um, and you want to get a good data set. Um, I know of some examples of uh, games that have been used to gather water level data and river systems, um, and then that's been used as, as part of science. Um, uh, sorry, part of scientific su studies. Um, so yeah, citizen science, ga science games is a, a, another good category. And then impact games uh, is sort of a, a catch all if, if uh, a game is looking to have a, a broader impact, uh, social change games might uh, fo uh, fall into this category. Uh, games that are looking to, to address some issues with climate change or saving more energy um, could, be, uh, could be considered an impact game. So when do we use games? For the next section, I just wanted to look at some of the the benefits and the challenges uh, of games. So when are games useful and what are the challenges of implementing a game? Uh, games certainly aren't uh, a silver bullet and aren't, aren't applicable in every single use case. Um, so hopefully through this section, uh, I'll give you an, uh, a, a bit more information so you can make an informed decision of uh, is a game right for, for this particular use case. Uh, games can be really good for boosting engagement. Um, they can translate complex topics into um, uh, engaging and, and memorable stories or worlds that kind of immerse us. Um, uh, the, the human attention span has dropped uh, drastically over the past 20 years um, because there is uh, so much going on in the internet and there's so many things uh, jumping for our attention. Uh, so if we needed to connect with an audience to hold the attention for, for a longer period of time, games could be a, a good way of doing that. They can motivate behavior change. Uh, I touched on this earlier, uh, where games have a lot of tools to, uh, to uh, draw the player in and keep them playing for, for a long period of time. Um, if anybody's played any mobile games, you'll know that you get these notifications every day. Um, and if you get in the habit of, of playing that game every single day, um, then it just becomes part of your routine. So that can be an area where games can be, um, or those tools can be applied to 
um, healthcare uh, or fitness or um, like eating the right foods, uh, all those tools, tools can be used for, for behavior change. Uh, the practical application of skills and uh, skills development. So games are great at training problem recognition, problem solving skills, as well as uh, increasing social skills uh, or uh, simulating different social situations. Um, uh, there are quite a few studies online of uh, people who play online competitive games and the ways in which uh, games improve those communication skills and make them better leaders. Um, and games also uh, kind of follow the mantra of you learn by doing, and then you get to apply that learning um, and see the results of the application of your, your knowledge uh, and use that to, to update your, your hypothesis about how, how a system works. Um, and that process, um, that experiential learning process um, is one of the strengths of games. Uh, prolonged retention. Uh, so this is, uh, similar to, to motivating behavior change. Um, if you have a particular use case where uh, you need to keep an audience engaged for a long period of time, uh, a game could be a way where you can get the, the person emotionally invested in, uh, in the experience uh, and get them coming back. You could form that habit um, over a long period of time. Um, we're working on a project in the um, adherence, medical adherence space. Uh, and it's really important for, for the people who are going to be using the, the experience to come back and use this, this uh, game every single day in order to maintain adherence over the course of years. Um, so that's a case where, where games can, can be quite beneficial. Uh, widespread platforms and reach. Um, digital games can be distributed to billions of people pretty much instantly. Um, so uh, app stores, the, the App Store or Google Play, uh, or through websites or through uh, uh, Steam and consoles and, and other platforms, uh, there's a huge potential audience. So uh, if you need to, to get this pr uh, project out to people um, and connect with them and, and distribute the project, um, they have a, a huge capacity for, for that scale. Um, instant feedback. Uh, I think this is this is a huge strength of games where uh, if you're going through an experience, you can know uh, right away whether or not you're doing an, an action or activity or uh, whether or not the answers that you give are right or wrong. Um, if you were training a particular uh, skill in a, in a simulation, uh, the, the potentially you're using VR and you need to uh, use a tool in a particular way. Um, the person, the very first time that they're practicing that skill, they know whether or not they're doing it right or whether or not they're doing it wrong. And that prevents them from forming bad habits or had bad behaviors uh, and can let them adjust and, and I guess shorten that learning feedback loop where uh, they can they can improve and make sure that they're, they're doing things the right way. Uh, personalization at scale. Uh, I think this is a really interesting aspect of games where uh, it is a very intimate and personal experience when you're playing a game um, and the the game can respond and, and be tailored to your particular skill level or where you're up to in your learning or development journey. Um, so a, a very uh, simple example of this is uh, if you've got 10 levels that, that cover um, uh, the, the learning syllabus, uh, somebody who knows the learning syllabus would be able to move through it very quickly and then maybe they get to the, the harder levels uh, much faster and then they're challenged um, and they're at an appropriate skill level, whereas somebody who is uh, maybe not familiar or, or doesn't understand some of the core uh, concepts, they get stuck on level two and the game can recognize that and acknowledge, oh, that you've been here for a longer period of time than you should be. Um, like we've recognized that you don't understand these fundamental concepts. Here are some links to some external resources, or here's a video of some of the learning content that you might not understand. So it's really that ability to respond and adapt and, and personalize the experience to, to each uh, individual uh, participant uh, can, be a, can be a really uh, powerful use case. Uh, measurable outcomes. Uh, games are great at tracking all sorts of uh, data about how we're using um, a, a game or, or our performance within, uh, within the environment. And that can be good for, for evaluation, uh, but it could also be good for the, for the player and, and their learning or their development, uh, where they get that feedback, they, they understand their, their results, they understand their marks, 
um, in real time and they can adjust their approach accordingly. Uh, gathering valuable data, I guess the the depth and the the type of data that we can we can gather uh, within a game environment. Um, I don't, I'm I'm not going to say it's limitless, but you can you can gather a a very uh, amazing amount of data. So um, if you wanted to measure like how how long people dwell in a particular space or where they take particular actions, um, or uh, yeah, lots of information about demographics or um, uh, usage. Like there are just a lot of different data points, and then th that data can be analyzed, processed, and reported on in a somewhat automated fashion. So some data points that might be uh, too challenging or time consuming to to record uh, within uh, within the, uh, the physical world uh, might be easier to to do in a virtual world. And I believe this is the last point, uh, a safe environment. So games allow you to experiment. They allow you to fail. They allow you to uh, try options that you wouldn't normally try in a, in a, uh, a real world environment. Um, and, and, and this also allows people to sort of push their limits. So if you were training to, to uh, land uh, aircraft, if you're in a 747 uh, simulator, um, you could push the limits and see uh, like where the breaking point is, where if you were training in a in a real world scenario, um, you wouldn't be able to push those limits. You wouldn't be able to to um, uh, see where the breaking point is. So you wouldn't learn as quickly. You wouldn't know like when uh, when to expect danger, uh, as well as if you had uh, gone through some of those scenarios where you had failed and learned from those uh, from those uh, lessons. So those were some of the uh, benefits, uh, but there are also challenges that we face when we're when we're using games. Uh, games can be it can be very difficult to teach highly specific or technical content. Um, uh, I guess when we're developing a game, we need to to program in or figure out every single use case or every single possible answer or configuration of, of the way that people uh, are going to interact with it. Um, and if it's a very specific or technical uh, subject matter, it might be that there are a hundred different ways to, to answer this question or do this activity. Um, and it might just be that developing a, a game or a simulated environment for this uh, isn't going to be an effective use of time uh, and just doing in-person facilitation or more traditional uh, learning methods might be more effective um, uh, for, the, for that particular use case. Uh, referencing, so, uh, Games don't work like a textbook. With a textbook, you can kind of um, flip it open, flip to the page that you know that the formula is on, look at the formula, write it down, and then get on with your day. It's a very quick process. Um, finding a particular section in a game where you learned a particular concept can be really challenging. Um, it, it'd be common to, oh, you, you have to open up the game. Maybe there's a level select tool where you can go and find the right level, but then maybe you have to play through five to 10 minutes of, of a level in order to find that one section. Um, and at that point, it's all too difficult and I'm just not going to bother with it. Um, it's also difficult to reference it if you were doing um, like a, a research paper or if you needed to uh, send a particular section to somebody else. You can't just send a, a, a section of a game to somebody else. You could potentially record a video and send that across, but because of the interactive nature of games, um, maybe that's not going to be as effective or, or actually uh, achieve what you're looking to uh, with that. Uh, personal preferences, uh, just like with everything else, um, people have pre personal preferences and that applies to games. Um, some people will like a particular style of game and because it's interactive and it's kind of driven by the player, um, those personal preferences are, are more um, exaggerated in their enjoyment or their willing participation in the experience. Um, if somebody isn't uh, like a logical problem solving sort of person and you sit them down in front of a game that has a lot of puzzle elements to it, um, they'll be frustrated and, and annoyed by the experience. Um, the, is there anything else about personal preference? Uh, oh, this, this also applies to uh, maybe a, a similar point, but uh, digital literacy. So uh, th this is a big, big one for the projects that we work on where um, 
two people might be uh, might have the same personal preferences, but one of them is very adept at uh, digital literacy. They have played a lot of games and the other person might be very new to games or has never played games in their life. Um, trying to design a game that uh, works the same for both of those people is very challenging because uh, the, the person who has low digital literacy might be uh, confused and overwhelmed and the person who has high digital literacy might be a little bit bored or think that it needs to be more challenging or have more, more features and functionality in it. Um, so it's, it is really good to understand who your target audience is um, so that you can develop a, an experience for them. Um, and there are certainly ways, ways around the, the digital literacy component. Uh, they can be expensive to produce for a niche audience. So uh, there, there is certainly an overhead in developing a game. Um, there's a lot of design work and uh, software development work and art production work um, that's required. Um, and if you've got a niche audience of 30 to 100 people uh, that are going to be playing this, this experience, it's probably just going to be more cost effective to do some other form of, of, of engagement, um, in-person physical facilitation or, uh, or whatever it needs to be. Uh, transformational games aren't great at fundraising. Uh, we've been approached for a few projects where the desired goal was to uh, use uh, either a sales price or, or microtransactions in the game in order to fund the experience itself. It's certainly possible, um, but essentially you've got to split a focus where you're looking to, to raise funds and then you're also looking to have some sort of change or solve some sort of problem. Um, and you need to have a priority on each of those. So which one is more important? And that splits your focus and you end up usually doing both poorly. Um, and you're also competing with uh, entertainment games where the only purpose they have is to generate as much money as possible. Um, so the, the, the option of what the player engages with and where they spend their money um, uh, usually goes towards the, the, the projects of the games that are specialized in a, in a particular area. Uh, you need capacity to iterate, and it usually requires a long timeline. Um, so if you've got a month to put together a project, games probably aren't the right tool. Um, there's just, again, an overhead in the design time and building and, and developing and iterating on the experience where you need at least sort of four months minimum is, is what we would usually recommend. Um, but for a more co complex project or where you're dealing with a, a very um, sensitive subject matter or um, other other situations might need longer, maybe it's 12 months. Um, uh, those are sort of common timelines. And it's also very important to be able to iterate, uh, to be able to get feedback from users, to be able to um, update your approach, learn from uh, the feedback that you're getting, uh, and then improve the experience based on that. Uh, you need a distribution plan. So developing a fun, exciting game with a noble purpose isn't enough. Uh, you really need to understand how to communicate with your target audience um, and how to communicate the value of what you're working on to that target audience. Um, it's, yeah, it's easy to think that a fun, exciting game is going to get people's attention, um, but there are a lot of other fun, exciting games out there, and you really need to understand how you're going to uh, get it out into the world. So those were a few benefits and challenges of um, games. How am I doing for time? Uh, those are a few benefits and challenges of, uh, of games, but games don't need to just stand alone. They can be part of a, a broader strategy um, and work together with other initiatives or activities uh, in order to achieve your objective. Um, so you've got the digital game. Maybe you also have text-based learning resources that do explain the, the dense, uh, complex learning content beforehand. Maybe you've got a video series that um, has... Uh, somebody playing through the game and explaining it for, for anybody that has low digital literacy. Uh, maybe they could engage with that video content instead. Uh, maybe you've got some sort of workshops or in-person facilitation for, uh, I guess, condensing that learning and letting people teach others uh, about what they have, have got out of this game. Um, so yeah, whenever you're designing a game, you can always uh, rely on these other tools, these more traditional methods in order to uh, create a more effective uh, approach uh, for for your initiatives. Uh, so I thought it'd be good to talk about a few example projects that we've worked on uh, to put some of this in context. Uh, so this is Kangazoo, the, the project that I mentioned previously uh, that we developed for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. 
Uh, and the objective of this game was to uh, appeal to uh, international students and get international students interested in studying uh, uh, university subjects in Australia, uh, being interested in um, uh, ecology and environmental science subjects. So the way we did it is we created a game that was appealing to the target audience. Um, you um, adventure around Australia, uh, exploring uh, our national parks uh, and rescuing native animals, uh, rehabilitating them and releasing them back into the wild. So uh, the game itself then has a lot of links out to external uh, resources where you could learn more about these animals. Uh, or you could, um, uh, there were characters in the game that studied at Australian universities and had bios and there were, uh, there's information about the different universities that, that are researching these areas. Uh, there's information about what research was happening. There's an encyclopedia of, like filled with entries and fun facts. Um, so it's really about capturing that initial interest um, and getting people emotionally invested in uh, in these animals in this environment, uh, and then providing avenues for them to further that uh, learning, that education. Um, so uh, through through the game, we measured a ten percent increase in intent to visit Australia after twenty minutes of play. Um, so when we can distribute this to to thousands of people all across the world, uh, we can really. Um, uh, uh, I guess ch change people's minds about a career or potentially change people's um, uh, future tra trajectory uh, for the, what they were going to study. The next project uh, that I wanted to touch on was In Their Shoes. Uh, so this is a game that we developed for Takeda Pharmaceuticals and Takeda wanted to create uh, a game that helped their staff build empathy with sufferers of, of, of IBD. Um, and the game itself is a uh, augmented reality game or a role-playing game where you take on different challenges that look to simulate uh, some of the, the trials and tribulations of living with IBD. Um, so you might get a notification saying, uh, you need to run to the bathroom right now in the next five seconds or else you fail the game, um, or uh, you need to drive home in order to pick up a new um, uh, pair of uh, uh, change of clothes, you need to take a photo of it, then you need to drive back. Uh, you're in the middle of a meeting, like it has to happen right now, you don't have any other options. So uh, Takeda did a um, evaluation study of this project. Uh, there's some information down the bottom uh, if you wanted to look up uh, how, how they approached that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, sh uh, it showed that there were statistically significant increases in IBD understanding and connection to patients, uh, empathy and pro-social job, job prospects. Um, and it encouraged uh, patient perspective taking and a strong desire to promote patient advocacy and reduce stigma around chronic illness. Um, so a fairly simple premise for a game, um, but really good at helping build empathy and, and open people's eyes and, and uh, broaden their perspectives. So from just those few examples, uh, we can see that games can uh, help uh, inspire us and, and get us interested in new, new subject matter. Uh, they can potentially change our career path. Uh, they can help us uh, see uh, a different perspective or help build empathy uh, with people in a different situation from ourselves. Um, the field of games is very, very broad. Um, and that's just a few examples uh, of, of some games that are uh, solving real world problems. Uh, but how do we know that they're effective? So uh, I thought it'd be good to quickly run through uh, some different examples of, of scientific studies that have been done into different areas of, of uh, games being used to solve real world problems. Um, the, the industry of games is very broad and the transformational games industry uh, or field is only about 20 years old. Uh, so I, I've never seen any uh, overarching uh, evidence of games are good in all, all use cases or all scenarios. Um, all of the evidence I've seen is quite niche and focused on a particular area. Um, so I'd say if you're interested in uh, looking into this more, um, Google the specific use case that you have in mind and look for evidence uh, in that space. Um, but games are, have been shown to uh, improve teamwork and cooperation with others, uh, improve management skills, uh, simulation and learning and feel, uh, learning physical world skills. Uh, there's lots of research into into how game uh, simulation games have been used in the workplace and and how effective they are. Um, games can improve problem solving and logic skills, planning, resource management, and logistic skills. 
uh, inductive reasoning and hypothesis testing, um, perseverance. I think perseverance uh, is an area where they've, they've done a lot of studies, not necessarily into transformational games, but just gamers in general. Um, and it's been shown that um, gamers have a much higher perseverance or, or ability to, to continue in, in the, um, despite of adversity. Um, and a, a lot of that is because when you play a game, you have an agreement with the game that if I try hard enough, if I keep trying, um, I will eventually be able to overcome this challenge. Um, and that isn't necessarily the case in the, the physical world. Uh, sometimes life perseverance doesn't actually get you where you need to be, uh, but it is a valuable skill or behavior to exhibit and does uh, help in a lot of scenarios. Um, and games can really uh, help uh, emphasize that or, or, or train that. Um, games have also been shown to improve memory, hand-eye coordination and multitasking. So how do we measure the efficacy in, in games? Um, ideally, uh, when we're working on a game, when we're working on, let's say an educa education game, uh, measuring the efficacy is fairly straightforward. Uh, we can uh, look at direct data uh, capture and direct observation, um, and we can use that to evaluate whether or not the, the students had gained the knowledge. Um, I thought it'd be useful to go through some, some typical uh, data points that we look at um in uh some of our projects just to give you an idea about how like what sort of data we're, we're gathering and, and how that's being used by different parties so the completion rate of content uh how far are they getting through uh the different levels um what score did they get on different levels um the usage data so when did they sign in how, how frequently how long did they stick around for uh demographics can be very useful for cross-referencing against some of these other data points um, where the user is looking. So in a recent project, uh, we tracked the position of the mouse on the screen and used that to, to record uh, where the user was interested uh, and what they were considering. They were considering options A or options B. Um, and this was used in a, a study where they were looking at if changing the, the text prompts in, uh, in the questions uh, had an impact on, on people's decision making. Uh, and then they surveyed people afterwards and they they essentially identified that even though people uh, said that it didn't impact their decision making, in reality, uh, the data showed that everybody's um, uh, decision making was impacted by some small changes uh, in the language that was being used. Uh, this could also be applied to uh, uh, virtual reality. So in, in the latest virtual reality headsets, they, they have eye tracking in them so we can literally see where people are looking at all times. Um, so if you had a particular use case where you uh, wanted to track, um, I don't know, where people are looking in an environment or where they're looking in a room, um, that could be something that you, you track uh, in these in these simulated spaces. Um, where the player stopped um, interacting with the experience or where they left the experience. Um, this is often used um, to improve the um, the, the content, or we see that um, a large portion of players were leaving in the middle of the level. Um, what is it about that spot? Uh, like maybe we, we confused them, or maybe they didn't know what, what to do. Um, and we can we can use that to improve the experience. Uh, value of different variables. So this is uh, something we've done for different research projects where we made it very easy to configure uh, variables and run different experiments. Uh, and then those uh, variables were tracked in, in the analytics platform uh, and could be cross-referenced against all of the other data. Um, so making that sort of A-B testing uh, a lot more straightforward and uh, somewhat automated on the reporting side. Uh, external changes in behavior. So if we can monitor whether or not people are acting in a particular way or um, surveying them to, to see if there's changes in behavior, uh, external changes in performance. So. Uh, if we have a game that's being used in the workplace, um, it's good to uh, it, potentially we're monitoring their job performance or how they're they're, they're doing in a particular at a particular task, uh, and it could also be that we look at um, group A like, played the game uh, for this long. Um, how do they compare against uh, another group that didn't play the game? And then pre and post knowledge tests commonly use those uh, for educational projects, um, very easy to run in a classroom environment um, and just get a, a early indication of um, whether or not we're achieving learning uh, outcomes. 
Uh, Nick, how am I doing for time? I'm... I'm, I think you're okay. Why don't you keep going for a bit? Well, maybe we can stop in at, at ten two. And, and and folks, if you have questions for Nico, please um please drop them in the chat or have them ready, and we can get up there. But yeah, no, please keep going, Nico. Cool. Uh, yeah, t ten two sounds perfect. Um, so the yeah next slide, I I kind of just wanted to put up a few examples of some interesting data sets that have been produced from games that might give you some ideas. Um, as I mentioned, evaluation isn't my area of specialty, but my hope is that by showing you all these different data sets, it can spark some ideas and some, some creativity of, of different use cases. Um, so on the screen at the moment, up in the top right is World of Warcraft. Um, and a while ago, they had a, a bug in the game uh, where an effect uh, sort of got out of containment um, that acted a lot like a virus. It got passed from person to person and uh, damaged their health until they eventually died. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, it got out of control, uh, the sort of capital cities or the areas of dense population uh, emptied out, uh, players themselves set up quarantine zones, like uh, healers went around uh, trying to save people and, and stop them from dying. Um, and this all just organically happened and evolved. Uh, they also had just bad actors that were going around intentionally trying to spread it. Um, and it's just this really interesting um, scenario. but. Uh, researchers actually contacted the developers, uh, Blizzard, and they uh, got access to the data set. And that was actually used in a few different research studies to understand how do viruses spread. Um, so this is a way where because uh, because so much data is being uh, attracted in these games, uh, we can get this really interesting insight into um, uh, uh, areas of data that we wouldn't feasibly be able to, to track in the real world. And that can be done on a huge scale. And then that can be sort of automatically uh, processed and analyzed. Um, in the middle top of the screen is a game called Fold It. So that's a citizen science project where uh, it's essentially a, a puzzle game that players uh, try and solve these protein folding uh, puzzles. And the, the solutions to those puzzles were used by uh, researchers in order to develop, develop new drugs and, and cancer treatments. Um, but uh, in a matter of months, uh, the players of this game were able to solve some problems that had been stumping scientists for years. So uh, that's not necessarily tracking data within the game, but it's getting the players to produce some sort of uh, end product uh, that can be used in, in research and training. Uh, I'll jump over that one. Uh, theory of change, I'll assume that everybody here is familiar with theory of, the theory of change. Um, and uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I'm not going to try and explain to everybody. Uh, but it is a useful tool that we've used in some of our projects uh, where we weren't uh, able to directly measure uh, the, the end outcome that we were looking to get. Uh, we've worked on a few uh, environmental uh, sustainability themed projects. Um, and the end results we wanted were sort of behavior change and uh, reduction in CO2 two emissions. Uh, and we didn't have the, the, um, the capacity in order to do a huge evaluation study. Um, so we used the theory of change to, to get a basic model for uh, how much impact we were having and whether or not the, the actions or the activities that we were taking um, were heading in the right direction. Um, so that's definitely a, a good tool to, to consider if you're, if you're working on a, a game project. And very final point, um, the transformational framework. So if you're if you're interested in uh, working on a game in the space or working on a project in the space, uh, or you just want to learn more, you're just curious, I would highly recommend the transformational framework. Um, it's uh, a free online ebook that uh, can be downloaded. Uh, there's a little URL down in the, the bottom right of the screen. Um, but essentially, it's eight different components that are critical to the success of a, a transformational game. Um, it's where, where we picked up the term transformational games over serious games um, and was developed by um, Shell Labs over in the, uh, over in the States. Um, and it also just does a good job of sort of laying out the game development process, the different steps that are involved, uh, what different parties are there and, and how they all uh, interact with one another. So the transformational framework follows, uh, focuses on the uh, following eight points. So high level purpose. Uh, so what are you looking to accomplish? Um, this is mainly for your internal team to keep everybody aligned and to make decision-making uh, easier and more straightforward. Uh, where you can say, 
yes, this is aligned with the high level purpose or this isn't. Uh, audience and context, you really need to know who your audience is. And uh, it's very common that we uh, get brought on for a project and the target audience is everybody. Uh, if we're designing a game for everybody, we're actually designing a game for nobody because we can't be specific. We can't listen to a particular group's feedback and design a game to, to appeal to them. Uh, we end up having to make something that's bland and, and unappealing. Um, so when you do have a broad audience, uh, it's always a good idea to try and start with a small subset of that and then expand out um, because it'll allow you to get to an effective end result a lot quicker. Player transformations, specifically what transformation are you looking to have within the player or uh, maybe uh, multiple transformations? Uh, what barriers exist to the player having those transformations? Um, is access to the game going to be a barrier? Is uh, uh, underlying pre-existing pre beliefs going to be a barrier? Um, domain concepts. So what information is contained uh, within the, the domain concepts that you're, you're dealing with? Um, what's going to be in the game itself? Like what knowledge is in the game? Uh, what's the, the prior knowledge that we're assuming uh, that the player is coming to this experience with? Uh, and what concepts have we acknowledged but said we're not going to deal with those at this stage, we're just going to focus on these ones. Uh, expert resources or subject matter experts um, are critical for a project in this space where they need to be able to advise and say when something is, is right or wrong or that that is right enough or maybe we should just not deal with this concept right now and we can leave that one out. Um, prior works, are there other games or movies or uh, like documentaries or like websites or, or books that have uh, tackled a similar uh, challenge to what you're looking to tackle? Um, can we look at how they have succeeded or failed? Can we rely on them to be a, like a component in what we're doing uh, where we're re referring to them or referencing, referencing them? Uh, and then finally, assessment plan. I'm sure that everybody here would remember to do an assessment plan, but uh, it sometimes gets forgotten in other contexts. And it's definitely uh, one of the, the most critical components of understanding whether or not you're having the impact that you're, uh, that you're actually looking to have um, and using that to inform uh, whether or not uh, you should uh, so yeah, spend your resources on going down the current path or maybe you change your approach um, and, and try something uh, new or different. So that is the end of the presentation section. I'd love to hear some, some questions. Um, and if, if we run out of time and anybody wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn, that's the best place to, to connect with me. Um, and I'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have. Um, Thanks, Nico. That was fantastic. Um, got a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, Danielle's asking, I, I think it was in relation to um, the capturing of information uh, in in the tracking, I think you're talking about the um, I forget what game it was, but uh, tracking kind of people's eye movements and where they were looking. And Danielle wrote, I, I guess there are ethics considerations around that. So how do players give permission for that sharing of data? Danielle, if I've misrepresented that, let me know. Uh, yeah, yeah it there was are particularly. I think it was the one where you said there was a virus and people were acting as healers and then suddenly researchers contact the game makers so it wasn't necessarily the initial intent that other people came in which is a little bit different i think than one where the intent is to find that out information out De definitely there are a lot of ethical considerations with a lot of these projects um and uh i think yeah all of the projects that we work on that's a consideration and we make sure that we get consent and, and make sure that the player understands what we're using the data for. And usually for, for the projects uh, that are used in that capacity, uh, it's very clear that it's, it's either done in a research environment or it's a, a very clear, uh, potentially it's in the workplace or, or, or similar sort of environment. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the ethical considerations were for the World of Warcraft um, corrupted blood example, mm -hmm. um, but there are a few research papers that have been done on it. Um, and I, I believe that they, they wouldn't have got any um, identifiable data. I think that they would have been looking at um, what, like where people originally got it, how far they traveled, um, looking at uh, how many uh, contacts they had and how, um, how many people they passed it on to, um, uh, uh, data points such as those. Thanks. Thank you.
Uh, another question was from Samantha, um, talking a bit, of, a bit more about the medical adherence game with people coming back every day for several years. Uh, that, that's the question. Could you talk a bit more about it? Uh, it, it is uh, it is still in development. Uh, we're hoping to to have it launched um, early next year. Uh, so I'll be posting about it when when I can. Um, LinkedIn's a good place to to stay up to date on that. Um, what can I talk about with it? It is, yeah, it, it's for for chronic illness. Uh, it's for uh, creating and and maintaining good healthy habits that help support their uh their chronic illness um and they need to to essentially do these activities and a, a lot of people fall off on doing the activities because um it's it can seem futile um and we want to create essentially a support network and a social social network um focused on the specific adherence um in order to help people live healthier and, and longer term lives um, if you've got specific questions, I can probably try and um, try and talk my way around it. Um, but yeah, I can't say too much uh, at this stage, unfortunately. Yeah, no, just um, thanks, Nico. Just, yeah, just interested in finding out more about uh, how these games are, are used and, and even that's useful information in terms of looking at the potential for evaluation and evaluation capacity building, because even um what you're saying in, in terms of building social networks through those games in terms of for for, for motivation and connection and the yeah this this yeah. game um is is more similar to sort of animal crossing than it is to like an action game or an adventure game mm -hmm. where it's more of a, a, a social space and I think this this goes back to the earlier point of games are incredibly diverse and there's there's just so many types of experiences that whenever we get brought onto a project, we look at all of the different styles of games and oh we need a a, a social experience that has this uh, cozy inviting atmosphere that like you want to ex uh, um, um, exist within that space um, that uh, is a good tool for the job uh, for the job or for the problem that we were looking to, to address with that one. Thanks, Nico. Um, another practical question was from Alison on what kind of cost is associated with developing games like these? Uh, it depends a lot, um, but in terms of some some like ballpark figures, um, it might start from sort of if you if you know what you want and it's very simple and straightforward, maybe in the tens of thousands, maybe I don't know, fifty thousand is a, is a good like initial jumping off point. Um, but those would be very simple, straightforward experiences. Um, and as soon as you get start getting into, I don't know, 3D or immersive gameplay or especially social features, so any sort of online or interactive features, um, you're probably looking at hundreds of thousands. Um, as soon as you're talking about like a massively multiplayer online game where everybody connects and exists in one environment together what what a lot of people think of when they think about uh, video games so things like Fortnite, you're talking about millions of dollars for an experience like that um but yeah if you were looking at the um financial times i'll see if i can jump back to this one if you're looking at the financial times uh climate game then you might be this one. Then it's a, a text-based narrative adventure. Um, there's not a whole lot of asset production that's involved. There is a lot of design and whether or not you wanted to be doing a, a lot of, um, uh, I guess, iteration of that design, testing with people, looking at the impact goals, um, that one could become quite expensive, um, yeah. I, I, guess, I guess there are also multiple points where you'd say, Maybe it's fifty thousand to to develop the prototype for it, but then is there an ongoing maintenance and support um, component to this where you need to uh, expand or or keep on updating it? Um, that's very common for games where you you create the the, the proof of concept or the initial validation, uh, and then you continue to expand on it. Um, so yeah, a lot of it depends on on where you draw that line, but um, definitely tens of thousands, ideally hundreds of thousands. Um, potentially millions if you're doing something really, uh, really complex. Uh, and, uh, but I mean, yeah, usually for most use cases, 
uh, we advise against those like million dollar ideas. And we just say, there's a far simpler way of actually achieving this where we just scope it down and focus on the, the core of the experience. Um, and in terms of timelines, yeah, four, four to 12 months is pretty typical for the projects that we work on. Um, I know whenever we work with uh, government or larger organizations, it's usually a, a decent amount longer. Um, worked on some projects that are sort of two years long, so it can certainly um, uh, take a little bit longer. That's great. Thank you. Um, yes, Alison, I think I'm, I'm hearing it depends as well. How big's your game and where does it go to? Um, thank you, Nico. Thanks from, from all of us for, um, for sharing these uh, insights. I think it's really interesting to hear from some different perspectives and it's definitely got my brain going around um, around how we might even begin to evaluate some of this stuff. So thank you. Um, as Nico mentioned, please reach out to him on LinkedIn or connect with him to find out more about these games. Um, do join us for our session tomorrow if you've got time and please do fill out the survey that I've um, put in there because we're always trying to think of what, what do we do next um, in, these, um, in these sessions as well. So thank you for joining us all and we'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. Nice to, nice to see you all and um, yeah, thanks for having me.